VDMX tutorial for music video post-production by Victor Acevedo. This tutorial will walk you through step-by-step -step on how to record a live mix VDMX session while using Soundflower, the iTunes player, and the audio analysis plugin. The resulting recorded live mix sequence can then be dropped into the timeline of your favorite video editing software for final editing and mastering for your music video. In my example, I will use Final Cut Pro 7. Soundflower is a Mac OS 10, 10.2 or later, system extension that allows applications to pass audio to other applications. Soundflower is easy to use. It simply presents itself as an audio device, allowing any audio application to send and receive audio with no other support needed. Soundflower is free, open source, and runs on Mac, Intel, and PPC computers. To download Sunflower, go to the website called cycling74.com. To begin the tutorial, I am presuming that you have downloaded your copy of Soundflower and have installed it in your system. It will appear in System's Preferences under Sound Output and also Input. Let me show you that. under System Preferences, first under the Apple, System Preferences, under Sound. Soundflower is there, it's been installed, and you've got on Output, you've got Soundflower installed. There's a 2-channel and a 64-channel version. The default setting is actually headphones for Output, and Input is the internal microphone, so we'll keep it there for now. So let's begin. The concept here is to get all your software tools arranged and working together. From there you can begin your recording session with confidence that everything is going to work right. This track called AWOL by Drone, right into iTunes. And uh, what we're going to do now is uh, launch the VDMX software, and in this case it's VDMX5. And under templates you want to load Simple Mixer, and this is what we're going to be using. And um, it automatically loads in two files, a color bar and logo file for Vitvox, and a uh, checkerboard on the right. I'm going back and forth here on the crossfader left, right. But uh, we, we're going to go ahead and eject those two clips as well because we want to start with a clean slate. And we're going to open some media, import media under file, import media, and I go to where they are. Uh, I know from everything's in the same folder, so I'm just going to scroll down to that. I'm not going to tap on the folder at this, I'm going to just open the folder because inside has other folders that I want to actually open into the and let's also load in a another folder let's go with that one so we have some contrasting material okay great uh, I want to bring your attention it's hard to see here but in the list the left source window this is the right source window and the default case is uh, pixel dimensions the size of the frame and uh, the uh, frames per second amount and uh, the right source has the same 640 by 480 at 30 frames per second. Okay, when we load in a clip, uh, I let's go with this one, one of my favorites. It's a, a little uh, oscillating sprite I've made. Um, so we're going to use this guy and notice I prepared because the final editing uh, is going to be done in high def and I want my graphics on this at this stage to be also high def. I'm going to use, uh, because of compute power in this current case, I'm going to use entry level high def which is 1280 by 720. And it's hard to see here but both the left screen and the right screen has updated the display of the size. Now it's 1280 by 720 and it's 29.97 frames per second, which is closer to how these little frames are mastered. I, I created them in Soft Image 3D, by the way. 
let's see, why don't we just for interest, let's load in a little background element on the left side so we have some contrasting stuff. After making note of the resolution on both these sides, left and right, uh, we want to look at preview that's located here. Here's a tab down here, and this is the preview. And this preview also needs to be the same resolution as the uh, source clips, uh, just for continuity. Like if the source clips were smaller, like say uh, 640 by 480, we could still make the preview window larger, but they would be scaling them. If you don't have the workspace inspector on the screen, where you find it is under Windows Workspace Manager. You open that and then this whole uh, series of three different w windows comprise the Workspace Manager. So to change the resolution of this preview window, because this is actually the window that is going to be recorded. This is the monitoring of, of uh, that could go out to a screen or projector. This is the monitoring window, but however this is the final mix uh, canvas that's actually going to be recorded when we do invoke recording. So we want the canvas to be the same also in high res, high def. So we're going to change that and we change that here in the workspace inspector under canvas main output and that's controlled here. It's the same little windows. Right now it's the default size 640 by 480 but you want to change this to 1280 by 720 just like your clips. So now this little icon wireframe t shows you that uh, everything's in sync at the right size because the gray rectangle and the the four corners of this wireframe are exactly the same size so that tells us everything's now at 1280 by 720. Okay so the next thing we're going to do once again we have our file ready to go our music track ready to go. So now what we're going to do is open the audio analyzer. That's also under the workspace inspector but under plugins. These are sort of like the basic set of plugins, clock, left bin, LFO, mixer, preview, right bin. Some of these aren't plugins but they're the uh, plugin related or plugins. But underneath that there's this little down in the left bottom left corner there's a plus and there's a list of additional plugins and we're going to use auto audio analysis. So I selected that and it, this little window pops up. And uh, let's talk a little bit about how that functions. Uh, I could even make it big. Uh, so you can see it better. And say we're playing the track and we top left corner of the audio analyzer you tap that button it turns red when it's on if I turn up the volume of the analyzer, it's actually reading this track. But it's reading it or responding to it via the uh, mic input on the computer. It's not using Soundflower. And you get three filters that you can map your graphics to or map effects to all kinds of parameters can be mapped to these uh, filters that are responding to uh, pulses and frequencies of the music at three different levels probably bass mid-range and treble but it's also dealing with the drums it's, it's kind of the intensity characteristics based on volume generated. So we can we can use this for a live session if you do a live mix at a gig because you want your mic to be picking up what the DJ is playing but in this case we want to record internally we want to record the output that's actually being generated within the machine by the iTunes player so that's where the sound flower comes in. And by the way, uh, 
you can slide these each of these they give you by default three filters but you can add more and you can move them left and right along the frequency lang range along the frequency range and you can also uh, control the amount of fall off and sensitivity by opening up this bell curve like shape this is very tight within that response to that frequency this gives you a, a wider a swath of uh, input to drive your graphics with okay we haven't selected any graphics to map to these yet but I'm just showing you how these work okay the next thing we want to do uh, and we could it's nice that you can size it and let's size it down and put it up here and we'll turn it off for the moment the track and the uh, analyzer so this open turn on and select the sound flower two channel input and where you find that is under the Apple once again system rep preferences sound and you'll see it here in the list which we saw before so we want to for good measure input came up so select that sound flower two channel there's also a 64 channel uh, output also the default case is headphones on the headphone port we want to change the output also to sound flower 2ch okay so now when we play the, the uh, AWOL track from the iTunes player, you don't hear anything because it's actually, it's not coming out of the uh, computer's default built-in output, but it's being played internally through Soundflower. But the audio analysis plugin can hear it. So say we're playing it and then you'll see that all of a sudden it activates. Let, let's do that again larger. Even We still don't hear anything but the audio analyzer is hearing it. Now if we right click in the gray field of the audio analyzer, the sound input device select Soundflower. See if I turn off the recording there's no response at all. It's not even picking up my voice. Right, which it would do if the uh, input was the uh, onboard mic. So, and we can vary the gain here, and and that drives the graphics, uh, varies the intensity of the graphics as well as you, when you map them onto these filters. So, the other thing we want to do, we want to be able to hear it though. So once again right click and go play through s sound or play through sound via the built-in output see in there you can hear it now and you can actually now the gain control uh, of the audio analysis plugin will also control the volume of the playthrough sound and also it's responding to the volume slider on the iTunes player panel itself. Okay, so now we know that audio analyzer or the audio analysis is reading the file. Okay, now that we've got uh, the uh, audio analyzer responding to the audio track uh, via the sound flower. Let's, uh, let's hook it up with uh, a special effect that would be driven by the audio. Okay, so let's, one of my favorites, those of you who know my work, VJ work, is the kaleidoscopic realm. I'm not alone in this. Uh, so I'm loading in a kaleidoscope quartz filter and immediately you can see that little uh, pulsating jitterbug sprite is now kaleidoscopic and you can vary the effects some of you may know uh, this is the wet and dry panel that I'm sliding back and forth so 
this is all the way to the left. I'm assuming this is dry, meaning no, no application of the of the uh, effect. And as I move right, it gets more and more kaleidoscopic till it goes completely kaleidoscopic. And if you go in the middle, it's a synthesis of the two. And the color algorithm is now called over, so it's kind of like one or the other. But you also can do this add, and it makes for a brighter image. So that's kind of like a, I guess, a chroma algorithm. And on the kaleidoscope, you can vary the reflections. Uh, you know, max them out, it becomes more circular, or limit them down, becomes simpler. I see uh, all the way to the left is now a mirror image. I didn't notice that before. And it kind of goes into various numbers of uh, symmetry from say you know like four or five and then you know many okay so now we want to uh, map this kaleidoscope effect onto uh, the track let's start it again so every one of these uh, kind of slider fields if you right click on them you can say use data source and that's where you're going to be driving uh, them from and the audio analysis we're going to use that of course and we can say pick filter one and that's this filter here and you can move that around so that's now being driven uh, by that that drum beat and you can map all of the uh, parameters of the kaleidoscope, there's reflections, all to the same thing, meaning the same filter, or you could map them to different ones, and here's the pace. The pace is going to be also mapped, let's map it to uh, filter 2, and then you can, so the more you play around with this, you'll find that you're now uh, getting the power of the machine syncing your graphics and they're now driven by audio analysis tool and you could also hear it through your desktop so this gain affects playback and it also affects uh, the uh, level of intensity of the three filters so we've taken things into really a visual music realm at this point, and that's when it gets interesting. Okay, we're back. The next thing we're going to do is uh, start a recording going. So, once again, we're just getting all the different uh, plugins and panels and uh, playback content all you know all talking to each other and all interacting and then we can do the official recording but this is all still part of the setup okay so let's uh, once again go to our uh, workspace inspector window workspace manager brings it up so the movie recorder is also a plug-in and if you don't see it on the top list, just hit the little plus button there, and there's a pull-down menu, and here's the movie recorder, and that launches. Now, the thing to note about it, it took me a while to get this. Now, see, I, it launched over here, and I can't move it. It's probably because it's locked down. Uncheck lock windows, and a little X appears on the top right of that panel, and I can move it anywhere I want. It has video source, main output, which is right here. That's what it's going to be recording. And uh, let's put this aside. This is the thing that would go to this monitor. When I say thing, in this case, I mean this monitor. Uh, let's put it off to the side because that would go out to your projector or uh, external monitor. But So the video source is going to be the main output. Uh, there's this audio source is grayed out. Uh, add to page means after we stop recording, it automatically will load into... Uh, 
the left and right bin so we can play it back or add it into the mix as we like. And uh, quantize recording, we won't deal with that right now. That's the movie record panel. And then there's the movie recorder inspector. And uh, there's the that's kind of uh, hanging down from the workspace inspector. So uh, there's a video codec, and you could record depending on your compute power and uh, you know post production mastering needs. You can actually record to uh, any a nice uh, variety of different uh, video codecs. Anyway, for uh, the most fluidity, given uh, the compute power that I have on hand here, I'm going to use the uh, video codec called Apple Photo JPEG, and uh, that's a good place to begin because uh, it won't bog down your system. It can uh, function uh, very fluidly. Being JPEG, it doesn't need a lot of uh, RAM or CPU power to uh, play at full speed. We do want high quality. You can quality. You got minimum, low, normal, high, and max. I'm, I'm going to go with high. And uh, you can record at the native resolution, or you can re record at a specified. And I'm going to uncheck native resolution. Native once again is the default set at the factory, so to speak, which is 640 by 480. But you want to do. Uh, in this case, 1280 by 720. So I'm entering those there. Okay. Uh, we do want to record audio because uh, we can use the audio as is later in our video editing software, or we can use it to sync to a, a higher bandwidth uh, file of the audio. And a good audio codec is uh, AAC. You have a linear PCM and AAC. I would go with AAC. You want to stay as felt and ephemeral as possible in terms of your uh, codex. Okay, something to note regarding uh, the audio source. When you first come in, this is grayed out. And uh, once you, in the movie recorder inspector, once you click record, say yes by clicking to say record audio and you set your audio codec, uh, the audio source will uh, activate and give you options. Built-in microphone, built-in input, and in this case we want to select Soundflower 2CH, so that's critical. You want the audio source to be Soundflower 2CH, or otherwise you won't re record any sound. Before we start recording, let's fine-tune our uh, effect. Okay, once again, it's going to record that and it's going to record the audio. We could turn it up. The small point, but could be very useful, is bef instead of hitting play and start recording, you want to start recording first. That way you'll get the track at zero and that'll allow you to uh, sync this zero point with the zero point of the track as it exists in the uh, Final Cut Pro editor. I'm going to hit uh, video record. I'm recording now and then I'm going to hit play. So now the recording included the zero point of the track and that's going to be very useful and let's do about a minute of that one fun thing about VDMX is in real time you can tweak the parameters of uh, the intensity of the wet and dry of the kaleidoscope or the wet and dry of the zoom, the wet and dry of your filters and other parameters as they're mapped to uh, the audio analysis tool and its various filters. Actually, as they're mapped to the filters within the audio analysis plugin. Okay, uh, we're just under a minute. We'll let it go a little bit longer. Let's uh, stop the recording. There's a red button, it says stop. 
Now it popped right in here and it's loaded in. Here's the original source clip before any filters applied and here's the thing we just recorded. <clears throat> so it the sound is soft which we can in uh, final audio mastering we can kick up the volume level but there it is it's playing back and the effects are applied and uh, it's in sync okay so we'll leave it right there and we'll pick it up uh, in Final Cut Pro okay just to wrap up uh, we're now in uh, Final Cut Pro uh, this is Final Cut Pro 7 and of course you can use any uh, version of FCP you'd like or any other uh, edit system of your choice uh, this is really just to uh, show the concept so I've loaded in the clip that we uh, mixed live and recorded in VDMX here's its audio and the important thing is you know it's a thin audio but you can sync it up with the full bandwidth audio of the the original copy of the AIF file of the track and I've done that they've lined up right here so uh, let's hit play and I'll show you what that looks like to complete the loop we can also uh, sync our VDMX live mix recorded graphic to a uh, live action that has also been recorded to sync or perform to the actual original track as well and in this case uh, we have a dancer uh, a friend of mine Robin Olive and uh, we'll show you what that looks like